going to start this. Uh, so um, hello, everyone. Thank you for attending uh, the talk. So we're going to just talk about some things that are coming in the future of uh, the Postgres community projects, some directions, things that other people are doing. Um, we'll do the technical deep dive into a couple of topics that would be interesting. But I want to talk about like where things are going in general in the Postgres community. So um, my co-speaker Alexander, he's on Zoom. Um, it's uh, midnight for him there in Minsk. So, so. Uh, can you hear us? Hmm? Can you hear us? He should be able to. Yes. Give him a yes, I hear you. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yes, <laughs> All right. So. Um, so my theme is, right, uh, you know, we've been hearing for a long time, like winter is coming, right? We've been trying to make improvements in the Postgres storage engine for a long time. There's been several projects going on. Not quite of them, you know, reached the finishing line. We're hoping what we're doing will become a model for what needs to be done in the community. So uh, just a little bit of introduction. Why the name, right? Winter, spring. And you have Orioles bringing in the spring, right? Oriole DB, that's where the name came from. Um, very quickly, Alexander Korotkov um, is uh, one of the co founders of Postgres Pro, and he's committed a lot of code to Postgres. He's one of the most prolific uh, uh, committers in the community, and he also did his PhD on several Postgres topics and that ended up as code in, in, in Postgres. So he's been doing this for about more than 10, 15 years. Um, myself, I'm a community advocate. I don't do any technical coding or contributions. My job is to convince people, sell them something that's free, right? Postgres is free. I have to sell it to people to get them, you know, to use it and migrate. Um, I'm also an organizer of Postgres Conf, which is one of the largest uh, global conferences. So as my role there, I've reviewed over a thousand proposals, you know, papers on how people use Postgres. So that gives me a lot of background about what kind of things people are trying to solve, how they've solved it, and how the community should solve it, you know. So that's my background. There. So. The first question is like why, right? So if you go to DB engines, there's like 351 databases, right? Who uses that many databases? On average, in an enterprise, you'll probably have five or six different databases. Even that is a little bit too much. So um, why open source? That's fairly simple. People don't want to pay a company just to access their data. Just because you stuck a data on a new server doesn't mean that you should have to pay for it if you're not really using it for production. So open source gives you the freedom to do whatever you want on your laptop, do whatever you want in the cloud, do whatever you want in the data center on your own server. So everyone's coming to uh, open source. Uh, Mike Olson's very interesting. Uh, he wrote the first C code that converted Postgres from Lisp to C. This was a Berkeley project. And he also created Berkeley DB, and then he was one of the co-founders of Cloudera. Um, second thing, why Postgres, right? So a lot of customers are moving to Postgres because it does most of what they need. And for a lot of people, Postgres is good enough. And they're thinking like, why do I have six databases maybe when I really need three, right? And can Postgres replace some of these databases and reduce the operational overhead and cost and complexity? And also for developers, right? How many different databases do you want to use? They can handle using one database, once the application has to talk to more than one database, it think get very complicated. Right. So um, Stephen O'Grady, you know, he's a, he's a long time um, uh, developer advocate, and he just talked about like how the pendulum is swinging from specialized databases back to a general purpose database that is good enough to do most of the things that you need. And Postgres is starting to become that choice. Um, so what are we going to talk about, right? We're going to talk about storage engines. Anything database related, you come down to storage, right? And the problem that we're having is that what Postgres initially had was a database engine that worked for hard drives. But now 
with the proliferation of cloud and different types of storage systems and different types of storage devices and all that, and, and then also you know, memory-based uh, storage systems, uh, it's, become, it's become a difficult model where one size you know, tries to do everything. So Postgres has a lot of tweaks and things that you can do, but you have to really, really know what you're doing well to get that level of performance, right? So the question is that can that be changed by having the possibility of different types of storage engines? Um, how are people trying to solve some problems? Right? These are the most popular ones, right? So everyone knows Aurora, right? They they just took the storage engine, replaced it with their own infrastructure, distributed storage. Azure Hyperscale, what they did instead is that instead of doing it at the storage level, they decided to use Citus and create a sharded out environment and they built a cloud out of that. GCP is the new one, they just came out and they did pretty much the same thing as Aurora, except they're using you know, Google's magic sauce with their you know, infrastructure. Now, for open source, these are a couple of the players who have been trying to do this, and this is before the community decided that there needed to be a way to do this. When Yugabyte first started out, I worked with their, uh, with their founders. Um, this pluggable storage engine model wasn't really ready for Postgres, right? So Yugabyte had to build their own thing, they hacked the Postgres code, and then they made everything open source. Cockroach DB, did I misspell that? It's a weird name. Um, they wrote everything in Go, so they could do whatever they wanted. And on the top la layer, you know, they just built enough Postgres compatibility to make sure as many ORMs as ORMs as possible worked. And that's as far as they went, right? So they're not planning on 100% Postgres compatibility. They don't run extensions or anything like that because that's not what they want to do. And then Cockroach DB also recently changed the license, so it's not really open source, right? Um, now, Neon DB, if you haven't heard, that's just a new name for Zenit DB, right? So there's some couple very interesting people, uh, you know, long-time Postgres hackers who are working on that. There's uh, Heike and uh, um, Peter Gagan and a couple of other people. So they're doing some interesting things also. The problem with all of those three is that none of that code is coming back to make Postgres itself better. They're all variants, they're working around the Postgres model and all of that, and even though they're, they may be open source, it's not gonna make Postgres itself better for everybody, right? So I present to you option number four. This is Oriole DB, and what we're doing, let me go to the next slide there, how are we doing it, right? So table access methods, right? So when the Postgres community decided that re-engineering the building sto uh, built-in storage engine was not gonna be possible because it was too tied into every single part of Postgres, it was gonna be impossible to test everything and make those changes. And the last thing you wanna do is experiment with the storage engine because that's where your data integrity is. So the community started to start building this framework called table access methods. Originally it was called pluggable storage engine. Now it's called table access methods where you could potentially plug in a new storage engine and use it on a per table basis for a workload that it was optimized for. So now everything doesn't have to go to the built-in storage engine. If you have something that has high writes or certain type of access patterns, could you use a storage engine that's designed for that, right? So some of the long-term things that uh, was discussed, like uh, maybe Postgres should go and use undo logs instead of the regular MVCC and all the stuff that you know causes problems. Uh, buffer mapping is something that we'll talk about a little bit more. And then of course, you know, the one that really kills everyone is when you hit that 32-bit uh, ID wraparound, right? So why don't we move to 64 bits, right? 32 bits are really what? I mean, I bought my first Mac in like 1986. That was a 32-bit machine. That was a long, long time ago. So let's get into this, right? So, um, so let's talk about undo logs. Um, Alexander? Yes. Okay, um, right. <clears throat> let's, let's talk about oh. undo logs and why you chose this approach and, um, you know, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, so uh, Postgres is multi-version database management system. Uh, this means uh, that uh, uh, different transaction can see the state of database at different uh, moment of time. Uh, 
uh, in particular, when you update some row, uh, it doesn't just change it in place, but uh, um, database have to uh, keep both old version and new version uh, till uh, some transaction can see the old version of the row. And uh, Postgres does it in the flat way. So it have a heap storage, uh, with a, which is basically a flat storage uh, where uh, all the versions uh, of rows which are uh, needed, which uh, could be demanded by some transactions, uh, they are all uh, st stored uh, in the same data structure. There is uh, no distinct uh, distinction uh, between the uh, oldest version, uh, between the latest version and the previous one. And uh, this is why when you keep uh, many versions of row, uh, for instance, uh, you have some uh, long running transactions, uh, which sees uh, old data, uh, you still have to keep all these versions. And this is why you bloat your storage. Uh, in order to uh, solve this problem, uh, uh, we have another approach. It's undo lock. Uh, idea of undo lock is that not all the uh, raw versions are equally useful. Uh, we keep in our primary storage the latest version of the row, but uh, we uh, evict the old versions to the separate storage uh, where we keep uh, the chain uh, of, the, of the version. And uh, idea here is that uh, instead of cleaning up old versions of row uh, in the uh, primary storage like Postgres does it in heap, uh, we can just uh, at some point just cut undo lock, uh, assuming we know that everything we cut is already not de demanded by any uh, of active transactions. Okay, and uh, in Oriole DB, uh, we implemented uh, optimized, uh, we implemented multiple optimization to uh, prevent bloat. Uh, uh, the most simple thing is uh, association uh, undo chain with every row, uh, but also we have a separate record uh, at page level. Uh, idea that uh, if uh, some page contain uh, already deleted rows, but uh, uh, those rows could be still visible by some active transaction, then we can create the page level undo record and uh, thanks to that uh, get rid of this uh, de deleted row in the primary storage and then we uh, minimize the bloating of uh, the primary data storage. Uh, another technique uh, uh, we use uh, to uh, minimize bloat is to do uh, page merging in trees. So uh, so if you have some uh, index and uh, some tuples uh, are get deleted and pages uh, becomes sparse, you know, so a lot of unused space, uh, a lot of unused space on uh, two sub, uh, two, uh, uh, two sibling pages, uh, then you can uh, merge them into one page. And all these techniques uh, makes uh, 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 garbage collection uh, for Oriole DB uh, not necessary. So we are doing uh, everything. Uh, we are doing everything uh, that uh, you don't have to reorganize your prim primary data structure because uh, we are keeping only latest data there and uh, we are doing everything uh, to prevent uh, sparse pages and to evict uh, the old, da old data into undo log as soon as possible. Okay, uh, then uh, to Alexander, the next I have a question. Yes? Right? So, so I think this, this is very common 
uh, this is very knowledgeable for people who are coming from Oracle, right? Why did why did mm-hmm. Postgres choose a different way of doing it? Uh, okay, uh, initially uh, Postgres uh, have a very original design. Uh, uh, Postgres uh, was designed in Berkeley uh, in the way uh, it didn't uh, required write a headlock to recover. So it was a heap sto- uh, heap storage. Uh, was just append only. Not uh, it was not like heap today, which you know uh, where vacuum creates gaps and the, these gaps are uh, filled later. That was just just append only uh, data structure, and thanks to append only, it didn't need recovery. So each page contained uh, the checksum, and uh, then you can uh, find. Uh, uh, Find easily can find the position of the last correct right, and uh, also uh, it was so just append only and no way to shrink, and it gives you a way for infinite time travel across uh, all the data. Right, <laughs> you uh, you can uh, find the data arbitrary uh, in the past, but uh, regarding indexes. Uh, it was designed so that uh, we don't need to recover indexes because indexes we can always rebuild from heap. So this was uh, the, a little bit romantic idea of uh, future storage as it was uh, seen uh, from <laughs> Berkeley in uh, late 90s and uh, late 80s and early 90s. Okay, uh, but the demand of uh, production system changes the way Postgres works. And uh, this is why uh, uh, it appears that we can't, you know, grow heap indefinitely. We have to, you know, clean the old data and uh, fill these gaps with uh, new data. And uh, so uh, prevent heap from uh, growing infinitely right so uh, we invent uh, the vacuum and also we made all this process uh, right ahead login and uh, uh, including both heap and indexes so, uh, this is how uh, postgres uh, came to uh, more uh, traditional design uh, in the <laughs> in uh, in this field yeah. Uh, but some of my ideas survived uh, till uh, nowadays uh, because uh, Postgres uh, initially uh, stored the uh, hip, uh, hip tuples in the flat way and provides and provided time travel. It's, uh, today it still uh, stores the tuples uh, belonging to the same row in the flat way in the same data structure but now it doesn't uh, provide you a time travel but it just uh, gives you mvcc still uh, keeping uh, old rows but not for infinite time just uh, so, till it demanded for active so transactions d- yeah so does oriole db have any vacuuming operations at all uh, uh, no it, it doesn't have it doesn't have vacuum uh, so we, we plan to implement uh, for some, probably we will discover some edge cases when vacuum uh, still uh, happen. Uh, and then we will provide vacuum uh, as a replacement of uh, PG Repack and uh, the, the same tools, but no regular vacuum at all. Yeah. So so the, the key design goal for Oriole DB is to take that ceiling where people hit a problem when they didn't realize that this was a standard Postgres problem, right? And then that's when people get miserable, say, oh my God, Postgres is so great until we hit problem X, right? So we are trying to change the headroom on when you might actually hit that problem because the scaling of the workloads that people are expecting Postgres to do today is much, much greater than what used to be, like like Peter was saying, like when Linux first came out, 
you know, the data file was like two gigabytes, right? <laughs> That's a different era, right? So um, let's let's go to the next topic, right? So uh, uh, Alexander, this is something a little bit different uh, than what uh, you know what is traditionally done. Can you talk about how uh, you build this uh, model for buffer mapping? Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. Uh, mm, Postgres, as as uh, every early uh, database management system was designed at the time of hard disk drives, at, at the time of spinning disks. And uh, important feature of this type of storage is that uh, it's very slow. So it's uh, very, very slow when uh, it uh, will position its head to the different cylinder. And uh, the different, so this is a one side of metal, right? That uh, it's uh, very slow. But another uh, side of metal is that you can assume that you your CPU is very fast. So you just have to uh, save, just uh, save your uh, storage accesses, right? Uh, you just have to do as less positioning of uh, heads on your uh, cylinders of your hard disk drive as, uh, as less as you can, just minimum of these operations, but you don't have much care about how much CPU cycles do you waste during your workload. And this is why uh, we have uh, uh, in, in database, uh, we have page level cache, right? And what this uh, cache does, uh, it's, uh, you know, contains uh, the contents of some of your uh, hard disk drive pages in the main memory, right? The most uh, recently used pages are kept in main memory. Uh, quite easy and if you you are accessing some data it's referenced by your position in disk but uh, you are looking from the hash table in memory hash table and check if this table already loaded uh, to the cache this is a basic logic but imagine uh, when you have large amount of main memory and also you have very fast storage at modern ssd or very very performant network storage and and so on uh, it uh, it becomes uh, all critical for your performance how fast do you perform uh, those lookups right uh, how fast you are checking whether your uh, page is loaded into memory or not. And, you know, uh, it appears that uh, it also could be expensive to do a uh, lookup in the some uh, data structure for uh, very large main memory cache. It's not for free. And uh, uh, this also could become a bottleneck uh, when you have a lot of uh, uh, main memory and a lot of CPU cores. All of them are concurrent uh, for the data structure you have for cache organization. And uh, idea that uh, idea we use in Oriole DB uh, is that uh, we can get rid of those lookups at all. Uh, so uh, imagine uh, if you are doing some search uh, in the index in some uh, in some tree, uh, you have to uh, go at first to the root page, then to its, uh, its child, then to child of its child, and so on until you find the leaf. And each time uh, you are doing uh, in traditional model, each time you are doing lookup in some 
main memory data structure to check uh, if the next page is already loaded to the main memory or not. But uh, we are doing uh, in Oriole DB, we are doing the trick. Uh, we have uh, in the pages of a tree, uh, we can have pointer which uh, could point to the another disk page or uh, another in memory page. So uh, if we have ch child page already loaded to the memory, then the downlink directly point to it. So uh, you don't have to go to the separate data structure, uh, which contains, uh, you know, some some dictionary of uh, which page is located where, but you are just uh, traversing direct link. But if you find some link which points to the storage, then you have to go to the storage, load this page, and and replace the downlink. Uh, this is how uh, uh, new uh, new uh, approach works, and I call this approach uh, anti-buffering. So it still uh, buffers uh, some uh, storage pages in the uh, mind memory, but uh, there is no no separate map structure. So the data structure you are using uh, for indexing your data, for organization of your data, uh, uh, it has been used itself to organize the mapping. And this gives some incredible improvements for scalability when you have a lot of main memory and a lot of CPU cores. You have a question from Charlie. Yeah, go ahead. Is this change done in the shared workloads or elsewhere? Alexander, can you um, hear? Could you repeat, please? Uh, yeah, is it done in the shared buffer or is it somewhere else? Uh, in OrioDB, uh, we have to uh, implement our own version of shared buffers because uh, in Postgres sh shared buffers are working in the uh, in the its own way, you know, and I can't reimplement it in extension. And so you basically, when you configure your Postgres with Oriole DB extension, you have to uh, set up how much uh, you uh, allocate for. Postgres buffers and how much for Oriol DB buffers. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. He kind of replied my next question because uh, the shared buffers on Postgres is very simplistic, right? So yes. And we have a lot of problems. For example, it's very complicated to do like direct IO and bypass the kernel pages. Mm -hmm. So are you doing some work extra to, to also avoid the kernel of the page and maybe that by direct mm -hmm. IO? Yeah, so, so let's say the question is that, are you tracking any of the work that's being done with the community on IO during, um, you know, uh, access methods uh, for direct IO? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yes, yes, I'm, I'm tracking this. Uh, and uh, Oriol, we didn't yet, you know, integrate this work into OrioDB, but OrioDB can also benefit uh, from this. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'll answer a, a, another part of the question that wasn't asked, right? Why is this happening inside OrioDB and not inside Postgres itself, right? So I think one of the things that we may have seen is that, you know, like engines like Zheap and Z, uh, ZStore, right? They were very biased towards heap storage. And that made it difficult to try other models, right? So the code that extends Postgres and the table access methods to make Oriole DB possible is like an extra thousand lines of code, right? And and so that's why that allows you to take this buffer ma met, you know mapping thing and, and make it outside of the Postgres thing because when you're using Postgres, you are still using you still have the option of using the built-in storage engine. Of course, the catalog, everything is still using that, right? So, so uh, what Alexander's done with the hooks is it made it more flexible so that you could implement more powerful, more aggressive storage engine 
types of methods, right? That's why we are. So he started by trying to build like a greenfield implementation of trying to solve all the problems and then working backwards to try to fit it into the Postgres you know, current model, right? So that's the thing is that the buffer method that's built into Postgres right now, it cannot serve all the needs, right? And it's right now it's not reusable where you can just plug in and plug out and use it, you know? So, exactly, right, right. So let's uh, go to the next one and then, uh, yeah, 64, you know, Moving from 32-bit to 64-bit, it just needs to be done. But again, some of these changes are so embedded in the Postgres code that it's difficult, right? And, and if you want to do this change, you have to build from source, right? It doesn't come, it's not a parameter that you can just change, you know? So let's, let's not talk about it, right? So let's talk about some results, right? What are some real-world results we have seen? So a lot of people who have done you know, DBA work and support for high-end customers. Hopefully, you'll see something interesting here, right? So first thing is uh, write amplification. Uh, Alexander, why don't you talk about this? Uh, yes, yes, sure. Um, uh, uh, so write amplification is uh, something uh, Uber writes about uh, in uh, its uh, blog post. So. Uh, uh, the reason, the main reason for write amplification is that um, Postgres have uh, uh, all or nothing strategy when you update indexes. So it have a hot update technique, uh, which lets you update just heap if you didn't touch any index and if you have uh, the required space in the same page. But if you touch any index, uh, then Postgres have to update every, every index on this table. And this could be very uh, expensive if you have many indexes on one table. And uh, there is a reproducible benchmark, which we uh, got from uh, one of our customers. And uh, this was a benchmark which uh, reproduces the, prog the problem. Uh, and in Oriole DB, uh, we have uh, in the, uh, indexes uh, separately versioned. And uh, if you just update the value of one index, uh, you didn't touch any other. And uh, this benchmark uh, pretty much uh, illustrates illustrates uh, this advantage. So uh, there is a reproducible test case on our GitHub with a table and multiple indexes and heavy update workload. And uh, in this uh, workload, uh, you can easily see how much throughput and how much AROPS or DB can save for you if you have similar workload. So especially when you're running on a cloud, right, and you're using EBS, right, so then you have a problem. You have to have minimum reserved IOPS and all of that, and that gets expensive, right, because the right patterns are very choppy there, right? And what you see with OLDB is a much more consistent, and, you know, you're getting almost like 3x the amount of throughput for the same workload, right? So, so for people running large cloud-based applications and all that, that's a tremendous, you know, potential um, um, infrastructure you know, cost saving. Right? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Rick, I think you have a question. <laughs> um, so, so the next one, of course, uh, is, is also storage efficiency. Also, right? How much storage you're actually using, and what's that extra, you know, uh, garbage uh, uh, that you have to clean up and reclaim and things like that. We we won't go over this. I mean, the the graph speaks for itself. Um, this is more interesting, right? So. Um, Alexander, why don't you go ahead and talk, talk about uh, block storage and what you did with Optane. Yes. And, uh, okay. Uh, we, uh, we have, uh, at, at first, uh, you can see uh, that uh, we have some improvement in scalability on uh, read-write workload. So uh, when you increase the number of clients, uh, then uh, you know in, uh, in Postgres uh, 
without Oriol DB performance degrades because of a Procare log and other logs, which becomes a bottleneck. It's a blue line. And the green line, the Oriol DB, which uh, works in, in the uh, same way, but you know, it uh, keeps its uh, uh, peak performance uh, stable while uh, increasing the number of clients. Uh, but uh, we also have experiment with uh, mitigation the overhead of the file system. So we have experimental mode uh, where Oriol DB works uh, directly uh, with the block device and uh, then we uh, eliminate the overhead of file system and the overhead of uh, double caching and uh, we have uh, you know pretty nice uh, plus uh, 50 persons uh, to the TPS hmm, assuming it was run on very very uh, performance uh, hard hardware mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so this this is was very interesting to me because about I think about seven six or seven years ago, Doctor Stonebreaker was doing some road shows and he would come down from Boston to New York, and at that time he was building Volt DB, right? It was purely in memory database, and uh, he had also I think HP had just bought Vertica, so HP was just paying for him to travel and just talk about databases. So this was very cool. Um, I actually bought. Uh, from Amazon, I, I got a copy of his book. Had it, uh, you know, autographed the Postgres papers. I have an autographed copy now, and uh, you know, and so he 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 was talking about the whole structure of databases, and he showed about sixty percent of the code and overhead in a regular database was just designed for the hard drive and concurrency and latches and locks and all of that. Right? He said, once you go into memory and you don't have those problems and or you have a different latency level, sixty percent of this code goes away, right? And that's what. Uh, World DB was designed for, and then he threw a little hint. He said, "By the way, Intel gave me a grant. They were, you know, working on this new technology. Imagine if storage was like main memory, right? How would databases work, right? So this kind of puts Postgres in that play, right? On it's not an in-memory database, but think about how persistent memory would look like." Right, and this is a way of you know reaching some benefits in that. So this is really exciting, and I hope we, we see you know more of this. Um, so so just talk about what are next steps, right? What are we doing next? So one is that you know this is a quote from Stonebreaker. He's just like Postgres is too complicated. There's like 500 knobs that you have to say every year. Please try to delete 10 or 20 of them. You know, don't add any more, right? Um, but but that's the thing, it requires too much knowledge to tune Postgres to do different things, you know? So hopefully, you know, the community and other people, maybe Oriole DB will solve some of this, right? If the storage engine is optimized for certain types of infrastructure, you don't need to tune it, you don't need to do this configuration. You just say, for this workload, I know I'm gonna be running this environment, let's just use a different storage engine. So that's the you know the hope, right? So what are we doing? So one is that um, the patches required to run Oriole DB as an extension, as a storage extension with Postgres. Uh, currently, it's all on GitHub. So we, we have it working with V15. So when V15 is ready in October, we'll have an Oriole DB version ready for that. It was originally designed for V14. We backported it to V13. And one large potential customer asked us to backport it to version 12 so that they could test it with their current workload and not have to figure out how to upgrade in order to do uh, some testing. So this is what we're doing to track all the work. Um, we are trying to take these extra hooks and upstream them. Some of them will go into version 16. Some of them might, you know, might take a bit longer. Um, and uh, you know we're just working with people on GitHub to just have them test it, report bugs, raise issues, do PRs and all of that. So trying to crowdsource people testing it on their own, and then also do some functional regression testing. Right. So one thing I will mention is that it's Oriole DB is not a replacement for Postgres itself. It's it's an adjunct, right? So some indexing, some advanced indexes are not available in Oriole DB. If someone comes and says, well, you know, I need gin indexes, absolutely, and maybe they're willing to finance it, you know, we can get it done, right? But right now, it's just 
simple B tree regular indexes there. And then we had some plans to do also some performance regression testing, you know, test the same exact workload with Postgres built in, traditional engine, with Oriole DB running inside the same exact, you know, database. Um, everything is up in a GitHub repo. We, uh, once we open sourced it, it's all under the Postgres license, right? This is under like making Postgres better. So the more people who can use it without any licensing issues, the more the Postgres community can benefit, right? That's our goal. Within the first month, we got over a thousand stars, right? So a lot of people were like, yes, you're fixing the right problems. We wanna see this work. We wanna see this get better, you know? So that's, we've done quite well with that. In terms of education, speaking at conferences, letting people know that some of these thorny, wicked problems are being solved in one way or the other. Uh, we're also working with some people to do office hours, to do a deep dive into the code, you know, what parts work and why they work. And then we're also doing some private developer workshops where someone said like, okay, you know, we need to use this inside our own application. Can we talk freely about what problems we need to solve? You know? And, um, so this is tentative, I think it will happen, but uh, Postgres TV, uh, you see there's an elephant watching TV there, okay? Um, so we'll probably do like a 90 minute deep dive, um, more, uh, more technical talk, more interactive, more questions and all that. Um, last month, Bruce did a talk, he spoke for two hours about microservices and it was amazing, I listened to all two hours and he did a complete end-to-end -end why Postgres, why microservices, why developers you know, should use it. Great talk. Um, then going forward, let's say, this is something kind of new, we just wanted to announce it. So anytime there is a new Postgres extension, the first question is that, is it available on RDS, right? And for a lot of people, it doesn't happen. Timescale had the problem, you know, everyone has this problem. If it's not an RDS, how do the customers use it? So everyone has to build their own cloud you know, just to let customers use it. So we are working with this company, actually, I am also working there, I'm, I'm, I, I recently joined ScaleGrid. What we are able to do is just go to the database service, turn on an instance of Postgres, log in as a super user, and replace the Postgres binaries with Oriole DB and bring it back up. And it's like, ah, oh, it looks just like Postgres. It is a fork but it acts like Postgres, it behaves like Postgres, and now you don't have to know how to run Postgres because the DBAS service does it for you. So we are kind of using it as a sandbox. If people come and say like, oh, we have this database on Aurora, we have, you know, actually a customer did come and ask us, like, we're running this whole medical database on Aurora, and it's 4.5 terabytes, it's gonna grow to 11 terabytes, and we don't wanna stay on Aurora, what are our options, you know? So we can easily bring this sandbox up in AWS, do a logical replication or something. And because the way ScaleGrid also works is that you can use it as a RDS service inside your own VPC, right? So for a customer with medical data, they can run their own private test, right? And they can choose whatever machines that they want and the service just runs on top of it, right? So it's very easy to do a POC with someone and just let them do it in a private you know, sandbox. So uh, that's, that's what we are kind of working on. And the instructions was about two pages of stuff, just some commands and things, but just launch Postgres and it works. So that's what we have. And uh, this is something I wanna call out. Uh, this is like one of the most fantastic things I've seen. It's a benchmark as a service platform. Uh, there's your elephant outrunning the dog. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just found that today, I decided to put this uh, slide in, right? And uh, basically, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we can work together to test Oriole DB running, you know, with Postgres and, you know, uh, and, and do side by side and all that. Because they have done all the analysis on how to compare different workloads and different clouds and all of that. So I'm hoping we don't have to do this all manually. We can just work with them and be able to, you know, publish some uh, benchmarks. Uh, so that's that. And uh, that's it. So. Uh, that's me on Twitter. Uh, if you want to chat about Oriole DB, you want to chat with Alexander and all that, just hit me up with a DM, and uh, we can, you know, we can talk with you, give you a private preview, you know, whatever. And uh, and that's the talk. So, thanks for your questions. Any 
uh, other things that maybe we didn't cover, I'm happy to uh, cover it. Uh, we still have about four or five minutes. Yes. Mm-hmm. No, no, this is my first Procona live here. I went to the one in Amsterdam, but this is the first U.S. one for me. So some of the engineers from PEV at the time was talking about how the storage engineers eliminate the need for vacuums, and then the world got crazy for a few years, and then the world got crazy for a few years. Yeah, that project unfortunately became the project, it's, it's called Z-Heap, and it, it, it had the same intention to do the redo, undo, log, you know, stuff and all of that. And that was a project that was sponsored by EDB, and they, a lot of engineers worked on it. Um, unfortunately, for reasons I can't disclose, um, it reached, I think, like the semi-functional state and then had some other issues, and it could not be complete, and it was... Either it was abandoned or some other people are trying to get it to work, you know, and we haven't had the time to go back and figure out why it did not work or why it reached a failure status uh, because these were all done in different, you know, threads with different people. Uh, but Z-Heap was supposed to, originally was designed to be the default or the second default storage engine built into Postgres itself, Postgres core. So it wasn't even designed to be an extension. Right, so what Oriel DB is as a you know because Postgres was designed to be extensible, right? So we are working with that model, and the idea is that imagine when MySQL first came out, it was just my ISAM, and it was kind of primitive. It kind of did database stuff, and then suddenly InnoDB came out, right? And everyone freaked out, like, oh my God, now we can finally do you know interesting things. So we're hoping things like Oriel DB and other storage engines that other people may work on are like. You know, maybe a vendor would come and say, oh, we have this express storage engine. Can we plug it into Postgres, right? Those kind of things will really make it, you know, um, a, a, like a new horizon for where Postgres is going to go. So the idea is that you should be able to customize it for different workloads, different infrastructure, all of those kind of things. And can, you know, it's not that one size can fit all, but necessarily is that you can try to tune it for different things. And, um, you know, and not treat it like a jackhammer where everything looks like, you know. <laughs> um, uh, the original design for Postgres was, it was designed to be extensible, right? The, the original team, they lost the battle with Oracle, so they went back to the lab and said, can we build a database that's future-proof? So it's amazing, Postgres is now like 40-something years old, and with extensions, it does crazy things that no one ever thought about before. And we want to keep on building that. If all the hooks are there in Postgres, can you do things that it wasn't designed to do before, right? Yes, Rick. Yes, yes. Is that implemented in SDK, or how, what was the implementation? I'm not sure it was using, I, I know the SPDK stuff. Um, Alexander, did you use the SPDK uh, uh, toolkit, the, the Intel toolkit for uh, Optane? Or was that just mm -hmm. a pre-configured machine? Uh, n no, no. Uh, I use just some some library uh, which provides. So uh, b basically, for Intel Optane, uh, you, uh, you have just block device, and you uh, do a map of this device to your memory, and then you have direct access to your Intel Optane. But there is some library which provides you some kind of optimization uh, provided by Intel. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I use this library, but I forgot <laughs> the name, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Dim Optane's, yeah, I think so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, huh? we'll, we'll, we'll probably go back and redo some of these benchmarks and use like a new baseline and keep it consistent so we can publish specific things that are consistent. These were just like one-off tests that were done because some customer had some expensive hardware. They said, like, yeah, you can have it for a week. Just run your test, right? 
So, so like one of the things I'm hoping is that I might be working with like the Equinix Metal folks, right? They have all kinds of you know crazy hardware, and uh, we can run some tests with it and have a base, you know, stable baseline that we can publish against. Right. So, very cool. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for uh, listening, and uh, hopefully, uh, everything's on GitHub. Go ahead, either hit me up on Twitter or go to GitHub and check things out, answer questions. There are a lot of nice design documents. If you don't understand anything, just put in a question there. You know, we'll try to answer it. But thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of Percona. <laughs>